all, I want to thank you for joining us as we continue to look at the truth about homosexuality and transgenderism. At this time, I'm going to start our session with a word of prayer before we start our presentation. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we honor you. We thank you, O oh God, for this opportunity this evening to come into your presence. We pray, Father Lord, that you will be with us as we go through this topic. We pray, Lord, that you will give us answers and you will direct us as a people that we would know your truth. Thank you, Lord, for this platform where we can share your truth. And we thank you, Lord, for each person who is here. Continue to be a blessing to all of us. And we thank you for all that you have done and all you will continue to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. As I said, good evening to all. Amen. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, Pastor. How are you? I am blessed. All right, Fabian, you ready for me? Okay, this evening, my session, we are looking at the church's response to the new sexuality. Now, this is the last online session we will have in this series, and I pray that you will join us as we continue on Sunday. But we call the LGBTQI plus new because in our faith, it's in our face and it's prevalent among us. But it's not new because sexual abomination has always been with us. And as we go further, we'll look at Leviticus 18, verse 22 to 25. Next. So what is this new sexuality that people are talking about? LGBTQI+. It's an umbrella term for lesbian gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people. The Bible identifies these and other sexual acts like incest to be an abomination. An abomination is something regarded with disgust or hatred. We say nothing is new under the sun. And while we may have some distortions to things that were in the Bible days, these behaviors are not new. The enemy has just heightened his attack on the family structure as we know it. We as children of God have to know, have to be knowledgeable about what is happening around us. And recently I had a session with the young people at church on what, what in the world is going on. Because there's so many different things that we're being plagued with now that years ago were not in our faith. So next, does the church have a response? And the answer to that is yes, we do. The aim of these sessions that we are doing is to bring clear biblical clarity in a sexually, sexual confused world. Jude 1 verse 3 says, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So contending for the faith simply means that we take our commitment to Christ and his church seriously enough to take a firm, strenuous action whenever such action is needed and especially doctrinal matters. We cannot compromise the word of God. Next. In the word of God, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 5. And I read it for reference and reinforcement. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and a view of his appearing and his kingdom, 
I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come, or we should say for the time has come, when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. So the church has the responsibility to preach and teach truth. The society has sought to reject and remove and replace God. But as a church, we are called to discharge all the duties of our ministry. We can't faint or buckle under societal pressure. If we affirm the LGBTQI plus in their lie, we are accepting sin and nullify the work of Jesus whose life was given to redeem us from our sin. As his sheep, we need to hear his voice and obey it. We have to make sure the doctrine we receive is sound. That means we are reading the word. We are meditating on the word. We are asking the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. No matter what is happening in our society, we always as leaders have to be ready to speak the truth. Preach the word and let it do what it was supposed to do. Transform lives. We're in the days when people are not accepting some doctrine, but we still have to preach and let God do his thing. We still have to keep focus on the word. One author says, when a man rejects God's truth, it isn't that he believes in nothing, he will believe in anything. I'll say that again. When a man rejects God's truth, it isn't that he believes in nothing, but he will believe in anything. So we, as the people of God, we recognize that the time has come for us to truly be out there preaching the word of God because it's given to us to correct, it's given to us to rebuke, and it's given to us to encourage. So we need to use it, especially now. In the Old Testament, next, in the Old Testament, there are two key verses that I want us to look at. Leviticus 18.22 says, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. This is detestable or is deserving of intense dislike. And then Leviticus 20 verse 30 says, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. In, Levit in Leviticus, God gives us some commands pertaining to our sexual conduct. And God's intention for sexual expression is within a marriage covenant between one man and one woman. Sexual acts between those of the same sex do not fulfill God's intention. In the word, you will hear things like perverse and abomination. And when you hear perverse, it's showing a deliberate and obstinate desire to behave in a way that is unreasonable or unacceptable, often in spite of the consequences. The enemy is trying to kill the generations to come because two men together or two women together cannot reproduce. So we have to speak out for truth and we have to let the world know as a church that this is what we believe and we can't compromise our standard. Next. Now I'm gonna give you the opportunity 
after this session, you can read Romans 1, verse 18 to 32 on your own. I've just highlighted a few aspects of it that I want you to pay attention to. Verse 18 says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then 21 says, for although they knew God, and we have a lot of persons in the homosexual and transgender community who knew God, they, never, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then verse 25, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. But the key verse I want us to pay attention, key verses, verse 26 and 27. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. And 32 says, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So our bodies are the temples of the living God. And as a church, we have to encourage persons to honor God with our bodies. The war of flesh versus the spirit is real. And here we see men and women leaving truth for a lie. And men and women engaging in unnatural sexual practices. The Bible says they were inflamed with lust. And, and that means a strong or intensified feeling. The women, the, the, we say the, they can do as they like, but I'll tell you, they can do as they like, but not as long as they like. And if you know truth, we got to live this truth daily. We got to be the example for others. God's spirit will not always strive with man. God gives us chance on top of chance on chance, but God will not always. We know him as being merciful. We know him as being loving. We know him as being gracious, but there's coming a time when we'll know him as being just. Those who know the truth need to live the truth, speak the truth, and be the truth so that others looking at their life understand that this is the life that they should live. So we're not encouraging living in darkness. We are not doing it ourselves. Next. This hymn in the church, God has this line. The Bible is our rule of faith. And Christ alone is Lord. And I'm going to say this to persons out there who are battling with homosexual temptations. We just want to assure you that God loves you. Yes, your struggle does not have to be your own. Jesus did not condemn those who came to him as sinners. Instead, he met them with compassion in order to restore them and make them whole and give them a fresh start. We are willing to help you and walk with you so you can be delivered. Because the word says, whom the son sets free is free indeed. However, such persons have to be willing to repent and turn from their sin and accept Jesus Christ. The struggle may be there, but have accountability so you are not journeying the new Christian walk alone. And as I was doing some research, I came across a snippet by Pastor Donnie McClurkin. Um, he's a well-known gospel singer. And a bit about him, he was molested as a child. And he said he struggled with his sexuality and decided to have accountability pastors friends surrounding him and this is a little snippet he said self-control needs reinforcement self-control needs reinforcement 
And so he set up accountability persons around him to help him as he was one, as he's still struggling with this, this concept of homosexuality. We may all struggle with different things, but how do we deal with them? And all songs said, yield not to temptation for yielding is sin. And when you give in, you let the enemy win. So you need to fortify yourself and be watchful as the enemy knows our weaknesses. The thing is, when we look at this concept of homosexuality, the key word we need to remember is it is a sin. So self-control really does need reinforcement. Next, just want to share with you some organizations across the world, and there are more that have various ministries that cater to persons, uh, whether they be in the LGBTQI plus uh, organizations. So the first one is Living Hope Ministries. Living Hope was founded in 1989 by a seminary student, no, a seminary student, someone who was in school studying to be a pastor. But he was wrestling with questions of faith and sexuality. Living Hope works to equip churches and offer support to men and women who are directly affected by sexuality. He was able to put a team in place after seminary school, after learning the truth, after having an encounter with God, to assist others now who are going through the same struggle he had. So the vision is to form fully devoted followers of Christ who are sexually and relationally whole and live, live in lives consistent with God's word. And then change ministry. The question you'll see as you go on their website is, can a person leave homosexuality behind? And the two founders, Ken Williams, struggled with his true sexual identity. And when his battle with homosexuality grew, so did his intentions of suicide. And last week we heard that a lot of times persons who are battling with this homosexual lifestyle, one of the things that they're plagued with a lot is suicide. But watch this. An encounter with Jesus changed his life. Today, he's married with four children, and he's on the front line helping others who are struggling. His co-founder, Elizabeth Woning, came out as a homosexual in her early 20s and lobbied for marriage and ordination of the LGBTQ individuals. But she also had an encounter with Jesus, which radically shifted her perspective. The love of God drew her into a re revelation that transformed her life. Today, she's a licensed pastor married to a man. And her heart is to see the LGBTQ community fully reconciled to God. Now, when we change has committed to sharing the stories publicly so that others may know that people find avenues out of the LGBTQ subculture, and identify to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. So these organizations are, are touching lives across the world and they're changing people, transforming persons who are part of the LGBTQ community. And focus on the family is one that many of us in Barbados may be familiar with. It was started, established in 1977 and it has many ministries catering to families, and it helps persons understand the biblical mandate of marriage between men and women. So there are other Christian organizations that have support groups, um, online chats for persons who struggle with homosexuality. And so for us, even though we may not have them set up here in Barbados, per se, there are persons who are counselors who are willing to work and walk alongside these persons to assist them. So the church has seen the need. The church overseas has seen the need and has sought to set up ministries 
to reach these lost souls. So maybe in Barbados, it's time for us to see the need and set up some ministry that we can help reach these people as well. Turn next. What God established, no man should defy. God established monogamous marriage between a man and a woman as the foundation of the family and basic structure of the society. The enemy seeks to erode this foundation and has unleashed a whole set of perversion into the world. But the church of God has to maintain God's standard. I want you to watch a clip uh, at this time, and then we'll have a short discussion on what has, what has been said thus far and on the clip that you will see. Next. Let's be honest, all couples have differences to work out, but for the spouses you're about to meet, the differences are bigger than most. That's because the men say they're attracted to other men, but have chosen to marry women anyway. And their wives say it's working out great. It's a highly controversial recipe for matrimonial harmony. Tonight, we welcome Alicia Menendez from our sister network Fusion to Nightline with this report. You're giving me all of this? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Husband and wife baking cookies together, the picture of domestic bliss. He's very easy to travel with. But the marriage of Tanya and Jeff Benyon is anything but typical because Jeff is attracted to men. He's a very good looking guy. So then why not live your life as a gay man? It just felt like there was something more for me. It just felt like I was selling myself short. But you don't just turn a switch, I mean. <laughs> No, no. It was a really gradual process. Jeff and his wife Tanya are devout Mormons from Salt Lake City, Utah. The only acceptable expression of sexuality and romantic feelings is within a marriage between a man and a woman. So Jeff has chosen to have a church-sanctioned marriage and control his feelings of same-sex attraction. My attraction really is mostly 90% towards men. I'll notice men nine times for every woman I'll notice. Your husband is sitting next to you talking about his attraction to men. How does that make you feel? I'm attracted to men too. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know that it makes much of a difference. And he could be checking out the girls just as easy as he's checking out the guys. Jeff says the choice he made to marry a woman is not an effort to change his sexuality. My sexuality isn't a choice. I agree with that. My, my faith isn't a choice either. This is a deep, deep part of me that's very important to me. So my challenge is to reconcile this, and I feel like I've, I've been able to do that. The two insist they're like any normal couple, even in the bedroom. So how would you describe your sex lives now? Perfectly Great. Normal. Yeah. Enjoyable, <laughs> uh, normal, uh, fully functional. <laughs> <laughs> Though Jeff compares resisting his attraction to men to being on a diet. When I'm having sex with her, I don't fantasize about her being a man. An analogy I could use is I love donuts. I mean, I would eat donuts three times a day, but I desire to be able to fit in my pants in the morning too. But am I miserable? Am I lonely? Am I denying myself because I don't eat donuts as much as I might like to eat donuts? And I'm not. And in fact, I desire to live a healthy lifestyle, and so I don't eat a lot of donuts. Jeff and Tanya are now going public, even sharing their story on a controversial new TLC special, My Husband's Not Gay. I'm attracted to my wife, for sure. And I'm definitely attracted to men, too. He's a good looking guy, for sure. Not gay, the show's stars say, because they do not act on their homosexual feelings, even if they are open about having them. Since I'm not seeking same-sex relationships, I don't think of myself as gay. The special follows Jeff and Tanya and other couples through the challenges of life in a mixed orientation marriage. So why do a reality show? Good question. Yeah, I think people are familiar with the idea about a self-hating, repressed... No. Any thoughts on the clip or anything thus far?
to everyone. All right, good night. The thing is that he is having the desire, the desire to sin. In any if if he there and he does he does up on the desire, then he will sin. Once he start acting upon the desire, then is then the 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 the, the taste of sin going to now come into existence, and then he's going to want to feed that desire. So he, instead of feeding that uh, that he's having from for, for the opposite, the same sex, he, he fight that desire by marrying to a, a woman. Right. And the thing is that I'm, he's truthful about what he was going through, and he expresses it to him, his wife, and with that she does not condemn him, she does not judge him, but because um that he may be able to change from from what what he's feeling thank you any other thoughts from so anyone kind of, else yeah, yes yes mm -hmm. He does know that, and he does say that he's attracted to men 90% of the time. So nine out of 10 times, he's more uh, going to look at a man, going to be involved in lusting after a man than even a woman. But he has gone married to see if that can help deal with his urges and, and desires. So is that a, a way that we can encourage people to deal with their urges and desires to get married? No, I don't, I don't believe that. Okay. <clears throat> what, what I find is that uh, if you look at another man for lots of desire, he's actually committing, committing the act, because the Bible said that, okay. right? Uh, so, so therefore, he's confused, and, uh, you know, and he's looking for uh, all kind of ways of trying to minimize it or, or you know, but actually... I think that eventually, if he continued in that way, he would get he would give in and he would commit the act physically. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Yes, Doctor Lisa, I want to come in here mm -hmm. because I think we are being ensnared by something which is becoming commonplace mm -hmm. and it's sort of engulfing our perspective. In relation to our identity and, and we are given into it and this this new whole sexuality is focusing on people identifying themselves in relation to their sexuality in other words you are gay or a lesbian or transgender or bisexual or asexual or even heterosexual it's all a matter of sexual identity and and, and basically the, the bible does not define us in that way we are either righteous or unrighteous. You see, it's a matter of, of the niche of our heart rather than our sexuality where the Bible is focused on. We are getting carried away by the world defining us now in terms of, of the sexuality and we are accepting the world's definition because notice he said that he is gay. So he, he has accepted that identification of himself and even though he has married um, a female, he is still identifying himself as gay. You know, is that the, the way we should be identified? Um, so he is trying to deal with that by having a committed relationship with a, a, a female, but it's still how he views himself. Now, if, if the Bible sees us in terms of the nature of our heart and not in terms of our sexual identity, it means that he has to have a change of heart in order to correspond with how we have been identified or defined in the Bible. So we're either sinner or saint, righteous or righteous. We're either children of the devil or children of God. That's our identity. And, and certain manifestations come if we identify ourselves as children of God or if we are identified as children of the devil. Now, the Bible condemns homosexuality. Now, 
you will say, well, he's not involved in homosexuality, but he's identifying himself with a sexuality that, that God does not see him as because a lot of the people who are gay now will say that they are born that way. That's their orientation. They have no control over that. So there's no desire to change. Just like a person is black or white, they are, are, are lesbian or they are homosexual. And that's how they identify themselves. Now, if we continue that way, then there's a lot of a desire to change and conform to what God wants us to be. So I think we have to start seeing ourselves now in the light of how God sees us and the need for us to be transformed. Like Paul says in the, in the Corinthian passage, when Weeks pointed out for us in the first session, there are many of you who are of that nature, but you have been transformed. You have been uh, redeemed. You have been sanctified. So all of us have to move to that position where our hearts are sanctified and we are living in accordance with God's purpose for us and not how we are seen in terms of our sexuality. And I think that that's where we have to try to get people to move and have a change of heart and allow God to conform you into in the image of Christ and his likeness and his nature. So you don't talk about no, a gay Christian or that you are gay because you should not be defined by your sexual orientation, not even whether you are heterosexual or not, because it's not just a matter of being heterosexual, because they're heterosexuals that are, are, are deep in sin, because mm -hmm. you have heterosexual relationships that are going on the wrong, wrong direction. So I think this is the way we have to, to, to teach and educate people and, and move in the direction that focuses them on who they are or who they can be in Christ and not being defined by their sexuality. But the, the person who spoke before you, Reverend Jamma, made a key point. The, the fact that he's already lusting means that he's already committed the sin. Even yes. though he's not gone forward and had an actual relationship with someone, he's already committed because he said he's attracted to men 90% of the time. So in his mind, it has already formed. So even though he's not gone into an act itself, he and himself has have already committed they said they're already correct. So, and as Jesus says, so it is in his heart. He's committing the right. sin in his heart, which means the fact that he's married to a woman does not solve the problem. It That's why I'm saying we have to try to move away from viewing ourselves in terms of a, of a, a sexual definition because he, he needs to be to, to be sanctified to become the image of Christ. Mm -hmm. Sister Barrow. Pastor Jackman touched a lot on what I was going to share. Okay. And I just want to say that husbands and wives commit adultery as well. And that mm -hmm. is sin. He is a homosexual. And we don't even know if he has not publicly said that he has been with a man. But if, again, he's all he's thinking about, he's attracted to, you know what is 90%? If you do an exam, and you get 90%, you pass, and 90% of the time he's attracted to a man. So, Pastor. If, if, you, if you get the clip and you watch it, further down, one of the statements he said is, one of the things he's always jealous of is that his wife got to kiss more men than he did. So, so I don't know. The, he's oh, used no. marriage as a way to say, or I'm married, so that's not a part of my lifestyle. But really and truly, the thoughts in his head already say, even though you are married, yes, that's still a part of your lifestyle. And he's openly now going on a show that says, my husband's not gay, but yet the, the lifestyle of the other persons that he's associating with as well is the same. They're just using marriage as a way to cover who they are. In Barbados, we have, we have a term that is called low down. Young people tell you, Lord, are men who are married to women, but they're still involved in relations um, on the cover with men. So as Reverend Jama said, it's a hard thing. Marriage in itself will not change how your heart is. God sanctifies and sets you apart. So it's a hard thing. You want to say something else, Sister Barrow, or you take it down?
Yes, yeah, so I was coming again. Just to say, oh, sorry. Be faster, just to say that if I am, if I'm wrong, correct me. That he grew up in the Mormon faith. He said that. Yes, he was a Mormon. I don't know what they teach, but if you were brought up in the, in in quote unquote the Christian faith, what is happening to you now? He was he's a homosexual. All right, thanks, Sister Barrow. All right. Yeah, Any yeah, others? I was, before I, was going, we... I was going to yeah. I was going to say that you see, we got to get back to the point on who we really are and where our identity lies. Because as, as God sees us, if if you're a single person, you have to live a chaste life in order to be living in accordance with God's design. Right. If you are a married person, you still have to be living a faithful life in order to fulfill God's design so you could be you could be in a marriage as a heterosexual which we we say is the, is the way to go so it's not a matter of moving from homosexuality to heterosexuality but it is moving from sin into being like Christ and be and becoming a child of God so if you're single there's a standard for how you operate because single people can be promiscuous and, mm -hmm. and go down the wrong track even though they're heterosexual and married people can also go down the sinful path, even though they're heterosexual, and they can have unfaithful relationships, which will still not be fulfilling God's standard. So we have to take the focus off even singleness and marriage, sexuality, whether gay, lesbian, transgender, whatever. And the focus has to be on the nature of your relationship with Christ. That is where the focus is. And if you read the Bible, you see the Bible does not emphasize anything in relation to sexuality. These are more than day terms and more than the emphasis all these definitions we have are not biblical definitions oh. it is true the bible says a man shall not lie with another man as mm -hmm. he lies with a woman but the word homosexual is not used in the bible but you mm -hmm. you understand that that's referring to a homosexual relationship mm -hmm. but apart from that you don't find a lot of emphasis on sexuality and that's why you don't want to get all these terms in the bible these are more than the terms that we have come up with because that's where we are putting the focus and the, the, and the emphasis is on, on our sexuality, who, or who we are, or how we identify ourselves sexually, whereas we should be looking at who we are in relation to whether we are serving God, and you lead our members as instruments of righteousness, or we are serving the devil and using our, our members as instruments of unrighteousness. And wherever we are on the other spectrum, that is in the devil's camp, the transformation has to be from being a sinner to being a Christian, not from being gay to heterosexual. And, or and being that, from, right. That is where it is all about. And that, that's the point I'll make in a in a in a while. But Fabian, you can go back to the uh PowerPoint. Thanks to those who shared uh, this thing. Because it is as you as we go on further, you'll hear a little bit about that in terms of what Reverend Jackman just noted to us. But this is a quote I found on the church's response to homosexuality. It's a little article by Alex D. Montoya. Homosexuality is more than a mere sexual preference, a social choice, a genetic disposition, as some say. Outright, it is a sin against Almighty God. Um, and, and the key thing is this degradation in man's spirit and moral decay. Homosexuality and transgenderism, it goes against the natural order of things. Homosexuality is not only sin, but it's also a perversion of the creative order. God designed a man and a woman for reproduction. And as we know, two men, two women cannot I, and the thing that one of the things I've recognized as I was reading, a lot of homosexuals now are looking to adopt children. So they're, they recognize my, my, me and my partner can't have, and they're adopting. And as you see the, the children who are part of these families, they grow up believing that that lifestyle is correct because this is what they are seeing. So they see that they have two daddies and to them, in their minds, that's it. I'm supposed to have two daddies. Uh, going along, people can have two daddies. They live in a house with two women. I'm supposed to have two mummies. 
they go along grow up believing that they're supposed to have two mummies. So the society is instilling a lot in our children because of, and we have to make sure our word is out there in our children's ear as well, so that they're able to know truth and be able to combat truth, uh, combat lie with truth. Next. So the church response is to expose homosexuality as sin. Expose it as sin. And sin is just breaking God's law. The church needs to expose the LGBTQI plus lifestyle as a sin, but also welcome those from that community who are willing to repent of their sin and accept Christ as Lord and Savior. So the same way Jesus met persons who were in sin, and after the encounter with him, he can say, go and sin no more. There was a transformation in their lives. God is saying to us, these persons are also in sin. And I think sometimes we want to highlight homosexuality is a big sin, and gossiping is a small sin, and we try to put sin in categories, but sin is sin. And as such, these people also need to be redeemed. So the church, we've got to expose homosexuality as sin. All right, next. John 3, verse 16, and this is something that we all know. God loves us, but hates sin. And this is a key thing we want us to understand. Love does not eliminate judgment. And I should also put here discipline because the word says whom God loves, he disciplines. We, we have children and we show them that their actions are wrong, even though uh, with lashes or with some form of discipline, but we love them. So the love of God gives us opportunity to repent, not to accommodate our sin, not to feel as if, yes, this is right. But God gives us a chance every day persons wake up in sin. It's another opportunity given to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So homosexuality is a sin. And while as a church we love all persons, we cannot negate our responsibility to tell those who are living in sin about the love of God and the wrath of God. How gracious and forgiving he is to all persons, yet there will be a judgment at the end of this love, life. And I, and I always say to people, God is loving. I tell you, God is merciful. God is gracious. God is forgiving. God is all these things. But God is also just. And that's one aspect we, we, we don't remember. God is also just. And so he loves us. But he's not, uh, he does not want us to continue living in sin. He made a way for us to be redeemed from sin. Next. We also got to expose darkness. And uh, you can read Ephesians 5, verse 6 to 13 on your own. You just want to read these key parts, verse 8. But verse 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. This is the first thing. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Therefore, do not be partners with them. That's key. Do not be partners with. For you were once darkness. It's a past. But now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Live as children of light. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And you can read the rest. Because it's, we got to expose darkness. God is light. And the word says, aim, there's no darkness at all. We all had a life, yes, before Christ. But if we are children of light, we need to walk in the light. One cannot be a Christian and a homosexual, and a Reverend, Reverend um, Jackman alluded to that, have nothing to do with darkness because light will expose it and make it visible. Have nothing to do with darkness. If you're children of light, we walk in the light. 
and let others see us walking in the light. And our life in the light should lead others as well to walk in the light. Go on. Next. We got to speak out against deception. And uh, you would find a lot of churches don't want to speak on certain things because they don't want to offend. They don't want to offset the coppers. They don't want to uh, come out and be the church that is known for. But we have to speak out against deception. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is in the word. Do not be deceived. And it says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, none of these people. But I love this part, but you were washed. You see that three that word, but that conjunction gives us a hope. But you were sanctified, but you were justified. So there's a change that can come upon your life. Even though you were one of those things noted, you can be changed. And as you are changed, you're encouraged to walk in the light. The culture is telling us pleasure is the ultimate good. And people are living to please their flesh while their souls are perishing. From the beginning, the enemy has been planting seeds of deception in man's ear. The word says faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. And my question to you is. Who's speaking into your ear? What are they saying? God has made a way for all of us to be redeemed. And so we need to know the truth. Speak the truth. Walk out the truth. And live the truth. Because if you want to inherit the kingdom of God. You got to leave your past. And step into the light of God's grace and mercy. You can't continue to live in sin and say that you are a child of God. Next. And I want us to look at this. Let's see if we can have a, a little discussion on this. And everyone knows the Pope is the authority over the Catholic Church. And for me, we, as I said, we got to speak out boldly and declare and be strong in what we believe. And don't be as, as a bitch as yourself, they should wash in in terms of, or these are some quotes I found from this article on January 25th, 2023, in the PBS News Hour. The first one says, Pope Francis says homosexuality is a sin, but not a crime. Second one, Pope Francis criticizes laws that criminalize homosexuality as unjust. And the third one says, we are all children of God. And I remember the first week session when we were at um, Chapman Street, there was a young lady who said, well, we are all created by God. We're not all children of God. Because to be a child of God, to be someone in his kingdom, takes a further step than just being created by him. And God loves us as we are. And for the strength that each of us fights for our dignity, being homosexual is not a crime. And he reinforces it by saying again, it is not a crime. The poor has been very wishy-washy in his statements on homosexuality, focusing more on the fact that homosexuality is not a crime. However, in many jurisdictions under his authority, homosexuality is indeed a crime. Our stance has to be based on the word of God. We have to be bold as we declare truth and speak against sin. What are your thoughts on, on, on his, his comments to the nation? Anybody? All right, moving on. You can go on to the next slide. Then it says, as children of God, we also have to extend grace. Grace. Christ died for all and we must show compassion to the lost. And there's a story told. Um, Jesus went on from there. He saw Matthew sitting at the tax collector. He said, follow me, he told him. 
and Matthew got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I deserve mercy, not sacrifice. For I've come to call the righteous. I've come, for I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And we all know the story as well of Zacchaeus up in a tree, called down. Jesus went to his home as well, another tax collector. And by being with him, having that encounter with him, his life too was changed. The good thing is, whenever you read a story in the word of persons who come into contact with Jesus, who persons wanted to condemn, or who lived in sin, the encounter with Jesus changed and transformed their lives. And as such, this same mind, the same grace and compassion extended to us when we were living in sin is extended to all who believe and repent of their sin and call on the name of Jesus for forgiveness. His forgiveness is not limited to some sins. The word says it can cover a multitude of sins. So we can't sit down pinpoint this one, this one, this one, not this one, this one. Whatever we have been caught up in, God can forgive us. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all our righteousness. So as a church, we have to extend grace to persons who are in sin. Next. And this one coincides with that. We all had a past, but God, and you can read this, um, Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 5. But the key thing here is, we all had a life before. And the three-letter word, but, because of his great love for us, God, who is richest in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead, in our transgressions, it is by grace we are being saved. We are justified by grace. God is able to forgive us of all our sins. And as a church, we need to encourage those in sin to run to God. Not run to church, but run to God. Transformation comes from an encounter with God. And a lot of homosexuals believe the church does not like them. The church has to be a place that shows love to all, but keep the standard based on the word of God. So we are not compromising our standard. We are not saying that they, are, they can't come, but we're saying when they come, the standard in the house of God must be kept. So if you know you had a word to preach the morning and you see five of them show up in your church, that doesn't mean you shift your word unless the Holy Spirit tells you to but you preach the word of God. The next one also goes with this. Next, Titus 3, 3 to 7. You can read this one as well. But the key part here, when the kindness and love of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy, he saved us. He extended grace to us in our sinful state. But God commanded his love towards us in that when we were sinners, he sent Christ to die for us. Who are we today to not share the same grace and mercy and love with others as well? So we got to let others know he died for me and he, can all, he also died for you. I want to share this story with you. Next, you can play this clip. This is a young lady that God transformed. That only God can transform. You can speak to people. You can encourage people. But it's the Holy Spirit that does the work. And I'll just play a few minutes of this clip for you. Um, you can go from 6 to 10. If you're interested God, in watching and I was like, God, I, 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 Go ahead. Go ahead hear what you're saying you know but i don't want to be straight like that's just not something i want to do and that disposition of heart that i had is typical where if you meet those who are same-sex attracted you will hear if you preach jesus what they hear you say is be straight 
when in reality, Jesus is not calling us to heterosexuality. He is calling us to holiness. But it's hard to hear the difference. Hear me, heterosexuality is not the goal per se. Holiness is the goal because once I get to know Jesus, then he works out all the rest, right? I think sometimes people have become what I like to call heterosexual evangelists, where when talking to the LBGTQ community, they will present the gospel of marriage or the gospel of being straight as if that is the goal of this life. As if when we get to heaven, we will have marriage between man and woman. Hey, marriage won't exist. What will exist is the lamb and the church. Will exist in the bridegroom and the bride. So we can't preach marriage. We need to preach Jesus. So what I came to see. What I came to see was that God was ultimately calling me to himself. That God wanted me to know him. That God wanted me to love him. That God wanted me to serve him. So I told God in my bed, I'm like, man, what you called me to is hard. I had tried to be saved about 18 times, reading the little sinner's prayer on the back of the little books about heaven. Um, and it just never seemed to work because no one had ever explained to me that salvation was a supernatural work of the Spirit of God, that I can change my clothes all day, I can change my friends all day, I can start listening to certain music, but that would not change my heart, that would not change my nature, that would not change my mind, that I needed the Spirit of God to do the work for me. And so I told God, I don't know how to do what you are calling me to do but I know enough about you to know that you will help me. I had no idea that that was repentance because I didn't know that word existed. I had no idea that was faith because I didn't know that that word existed. But what had happened was, is I saw my sin rightly. I saw it as unworthy of my time. I saw it as unworthy of my attention. I saw it as worthless. I saw it as not good. I saw it as an idol. I saw it as a lie. All of my sin hence. I saw it all for what it was and I turned. But I didn't turn to self-righteousness. I didn't turn in on myself to think that I could make myself saved. What I did was I turned to Christ, seeing that only he could save me, only he could change me, only he could renew me, only he could sanctify me, only he could regenerate me, and I had no choice but to believe. Faith is not optional. God was not suggesting that I would repent and believe in his name. He was commanding it. So that's what I did and God saved me. And I knew I was different the next day because I went to work. Oh, you can stop it. I you used to work at Wendy's. So if y'all want the recipe for And this, this is a key point. This is a young lady. Her name is Jackie Hill Perry. And you can go on YouTube. Um, in the beginning of this, she noted that she had no father figure. And she did not trust me. She was introduced to pornography at the age of six. She was molested at the age of seven. And she had a warped idea about sexuality. This new generation, this generation that we're in, has been introduced to sexuality in a very distorted form. We have to impress upon them the creative directive. And you'll see that. The, the tenets of the church God are key. And even when it comes to marriage between male and female, the good thing with her, just as others, they had an encounter with God. Her encounter came lying on her bed in her house. God was calling her to himself. And salvation, we need to recognize, is a supernatural work of God. So, so that means there are times when people will hear a message in the church, but that does not mean their transformation occurs there. But wherever it occurs, wherever it occurs, what, whatever God does, his timing and his place is always the best. So the spirit of God is what transforms. And this lady today goes around the world. She has various speaking platforms. And she is a minister 
of the gospel today, coming out of a life where she, they would call her a butch, where she had her various girlfriends, where she would dress in a very boyish manner. And today she goes across the world doing her poetry and doing her, her um, speaking, married to a man and has children. So the question is, can persons change? And the answer is God can change anybody. God can transform anyone. Jesus calls us to holiness. She spoke about persons who speak into the LGBTQ, trying to share the concept of being a heterosexual. But one of the things that God has called us to is holiness. You can go on to the next slide. One of the things that God has called us to is holiness. Jesus was not calling her to be a heterosexual. He was calling her to holiness. And so as a church, there has to be no compromise when we stand because God has a standard. You can't be, a, and, I, and I want you to understand this, you can't be a practicing homosexual, a priest, a pastor, a bishop. All these, you can't practice it as a, you're out there doing the action, out there being involved in the lifestyle, out there doing the thing. And then on Sunday, it just switches off and you come into the church. God is able to redeem. God is able to deliver. And so persons of this out, leaders or persons who are found um, practicing, living in darkness, God is willing to bring you into the light. My question to you is this. If you are living in darkness, what spirit are you bringing into the church? Because you're, you're a part of this life. What spirit are you bringing into the church? Because living in darkness means that the spirit within you is not the Holy Spirit. It's not the spirit that you want, that you want to be in the presence of God. And what spirit are you worshiping? And those are key things we need to ask ourselves. Because the standard still is holiness, righteousness, and purity. So while we encourage persons who are homosexual and who are transgender to change their lifestyle, we, we, we want them to change a place where they live holy, a life of devotion to God, where they recognize they're set apart from sin. The word says that commands us to be holy as God is holy. We want them to be righteous, being right in the eyes of God, we, we have to conduct our lives in a manner that reflects our relationship with the Lord. We want them to be pure. And Psalm 119 verse 9 says, how can a young man, and when it says man, we know man or woman, keep their way pure. It says by living according to the word of God. So even though we don't compromise our standard, we need to speak out and put our standard out there. And we need to live this standard that we speak. Because as you said, the only Jesus some people see is the Jesus in us. All right. So. Go back to the next slide. Go backwards. If any thoughts thus far? Before I go on to the last part. Mm. Um, Carl Richards. Okay. All right, you can go on since no one. Yeah, yeah I want to speak. I want to speak. I, well, I thought, okay, well. I mm, thought okay. Carl was going to speak. You oh, no, I saw she wrote it in the chat. Oh. Uh -huh. oh. Okay, well, I was going to say that that Jackie Hill Perry, well, she was the leader. I would have mentioned that the first session we had at Chapman Street, who was a lesbian and was transformed by the power of God. I noticed that she had, you know, a, a pretty bad background in her life that, that would have exercised a certain amount of, of, of influence in the type of person she um, had grown up to be. And again, sometimes we, we we view our identity in terms of what has happened to us, what we have gone through. And sometimes we look 
again to the psychology and the sociology and the psychiatry to do therapy on us, to, to bring us back to what we would consider as wholeness. Again, because we are identifying ourselves in terms of our social background and certain things that we have passed through. But she made the point again, it all comes back to Christ. It's Correct. Christ that makes a difference in our lives. Correct. That's what we have to point people to. So the homosexual needs Christ. And you see, and I, I think why they're compromising with it and, and the sad thing is that we have a lot of churches that are defend with this, this whole phenomenon and saying that you can be gay and Christian and because they are identifying themselves in the light of their, their sexuality. sexuality. As far as they're, yeah, as far as they're concerned, that is a sexual orientation. Again, that is another um, sort of modernized societal definition. So, so in other words, you are born gay. That's who you are in terms of your identity. So you, you can't change that. And God accepts you as he would accept the heterosexual because the heterosexual is born that way. The gay person is born that way. So God accepts him in that way so he can function as a Christian because that's his orientation and he doesn't need to change. But as you gratefully pointed out and you, you, you establish a very good foundation, we have to look at this, this, this matter as sin. Because if you look in, in the Proverbs where God identifies the sins that he hates, he doesn't even mention anything in relation to sexuality. So it's all a nature of, of sin and really heart needs to come. It says that there are 16 the Lord hates and seven are detestable. Haughty eyes, a lying mm -hmm. tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You hear anything there about sexuality? No, it's the same nature in the heart that, that God despises and that we all need to change and whatever form it manifests itself, because man has fallen and the fallen nature of sin manifests itself in all these different forms, homosexuality, um, lying, stealing, cheating, all of these are manifestations of sin and we need to be saved from sin, as you rightfully said. And the grace of God is there to save us Amen. from sin, right? Yeah. Now they argue that the, that the, the eunuch, he will, he will go, because the Bible talks about there are some that are eunuchs, there are some who have been made eunuchs, and there are some who have been born you know, and they use that argument as we tell, as you actually said, you need to teach people the truth about the Bible because people can interpret the Bible to mean what they want it to mean to support their position. So they're saying that the eunuch was, was homosexual and he was born that way because God says that they're, they're, they're eunuchs who are born eunuchs. But, but that, that, that has nothing to do with homosexuality. And even if he was born that way, he needed to be saved and God sent somebody to him to bring salvation to him. Oh, yes. But, 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 but that, so that's the point. It's a change of heart wherever you are. In whatever condition you find yourself, it's Christ that makes the difference. And we got a point, as Jack Hill said, point people to Christ. That's the important thing. Are you ready right. said it? Let's go on to our last bit, Fabian. So the but last the, thing for um, me. Your persons. Um, I think Minister James. Go ahead. Persons who signs were, I'm sorry about that. Renee Boyce, go ahead. Hi, good night, everybody. Just, just quickly, I like the title of your slide. It says no compromise. And I think that's where the church in general is having a problem in today's society. I remember years ago, it was remarked that people used to preach from the platform that sex before marriage was sin. And, you know, these are the things that used to be said in church. But now what we have is persons who are in positions of authority. And this is the church generally are not willing to say or or maybe not not that they're not willing or but they just have decided that they're not going to stand up and say, this is this and this is that. This is right and this is wrong. And therefore, the children who are coming up don't hear certain messages and they're easily swayed by what goes on in society. So if we don't give them the foundation that they need from going to church, then they're going to go to school and here it's okay to be gay, it's okay to be homosexual. And for those who are not rooted and grounded, who don't have strong family backgrounds, then they're up for anything. Hmm. So that's just that's just my my input. 
we we can't compromise. All right. You say somebody else, uh, Fabian. I think Mr. James had a comment. Hi, good night. I did. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to, uh, the, the last two people already hit on what I wanted, but I, I would, I just want to throw in here that, uh, or ask the questions, I should say. Um, we are saying all of this, this is all good. And I, I mean, I really appreciate these few days that you guys had this. Congratulations. But are we teaching our young people how to go and witness? That's one of the things that I think is lacking in churches. Uh, I remember years ago in the church, we used to we I, we had we had a vibrant young people that they, they, the 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 elder the more elder or seasoned Christians would take them on their wings and and take them out into the community and 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 show them how to witness to people. This is one of the things that I believe is lacking. We can't compromise. I agree, but we also need to teach our 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 people how to go out there and witness because the, the, the gays and the homosexuals and us, they're not coming into the church. And therefore, if we, we, we the church can't go to them because we don't know how to witness to them. Mm. We don't know how to show the love instead of being, being uh, coming down on them and saying, man, this is a sin, this is a sin. We don't, we, we, it's not just doing that. It is, it's going out there and showing them the love of Jesus Christ. And showing them how that you know this thing that you're doing is not the way to go. And like Renia rightfully said, the 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 church is not teaching the the, the youngsters, so they're going to school and they're getting the teachings. Yeah. And it, and the, and the schools are saying, hey, this thing is okay. And the church is keeping its mouth shut <laughs> in, in the sense of I don't want to offend nobody because I don't want to lose my ties and offerings. Members, mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying? We don't want to lose the members. So therefore, we are keeping our mouth shut and letting everything slide. When 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 the devil out there is reaping havoc on our on our on our young people, and they're grabbing them left, right, and center, because the know the seasoned Christians or the people in the church ain't coming out to the church. They're standing in the church and holy hallelujah hard, but the youngsters are the ones that he's going after because they're the ones that are in these schools where they can be influenced. So even though they're going to church, they they still have their own mindset you well but my teachers say that this thing is not wrong uh, the people at school is saying that this thing is not how comes you guys telling me that it wrong all of a sudden because you see me doing it so we, we i think simply we gotta really teach get back to the to the the the, the first love where we teach our Correct. people how to how to go out there and be a witness no i just i know we just going to going going work and going to our places and we're witnessing either so we're guilty. We're just as guilty. We we are good to say, oh, I am a Christian. And people looking at me and you're doing nothing as a Christian. Mm. Thank you. All right. And, and he hits the point that we're going to go into. Going to the next slide. This, this last section looks at saving our children. There's a song that was played at the Gear Pride Parade in America this year. We're coming for your children. We're coming for them because they're young. And you can, and you can go on YouTube and sit down and listen to this song. We're coming for your children. We're coming for your children. We're coming for them because they're young. You know, the word actually says the same thing, that we want the children because they're young and they're strong. And the, 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 they're putting it in their song and they're walking and marching and they're saying it. And as Minister Jim said, we have to be able to to share the message with our children and our children have to be strong enough to share it with others as well because they're going into schools that being right now our school system has allowed our children to express themselves and persons who are on on the platform would have heard about the grooming policy um, where the ministry now has allowed children to express themselves whether it be their hair and you see for those who catch the bus and are traveling along the road, you see now the type of hairstyles our young men have. You see how tight their pants are, the, the, the mannerisms that they have and what's not. So we got to put things in place to save our children because they are the generation that are here now, but will be impacting other generations in the future. 
So as a church, we need to be aware of what is happening in our world. We also need to note various legislations and laws that may be enacted. The word says my people perish for lack of knowledge, but as a church, we have to know. Some call it Sonia saying that we gotta know, we gotta know. We got to know. We can't put our head in the sand and say, my dad ain't going to affect me. We as a church have to be watchful of what is happening on a daily basis in our nation. Go to the next slide. I want you to watch these. Well, the first one I'll just play for about a minute or two. Watch this clip. I love being creative. I love exploring with makeup. Kids don't always know what to make of us. Things like gender are like the last thing on their mind. They look like um like mermaids and queens. Are we done yet? Hi, I'm Miss P. I am the director for Directing Story Hour this hour. Welcome! When I first heard about it, I was just like, where can I sign up? And I was part of the first few girls who started Drag Queen Story Hour in New York City. So when I put on my wig on my dress, like, I'm ready to go save the world. How many of you want to be a mermaid when you grow up? For me, I think Drag Queen Story Hour is just such a natural fit. It's like one of those ideas that's just so good that I'm shocked that no one had thought of it sooner. So what do you think a drag queen is? A queen of dragons. We really are. We entertain, we lip sync, we are funny. We're like clowns, but prettier. And I get to hang out with people like you. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Story time at a Brooklyn Public Library prompting a protest this morning. And it's who is reading to those children is what parents are upset about. We have a drag queen which is a man dressed as a woman coming to read to children, not about cat in the hat, about gender fluidity. I like to invite them in to see before they judge a drag queen story hour. I All right, you can, you can stop this one and play the other one fully. No, you can stop this one and play the, the next Shoes. one. Shoes. All right, if it's... All right, it's not available. Okay. If it's not available, that's no problem. Um, but this is something that is happening around us today. We may hear about it overseas, as in the, they're reading in the libraries, they're coming into schools. But I want you to recognize when they're going to a library, the parents brought these children there to see and to hear these persons reading. And do, do, do you think that these people are naive to the impact? You can, you can play. Do you think these people are naive? Not, not this one, the one you had. All right. You have a little problem there, that's a problem. But these, do you think these people are this one? Then the doors burst open. The king and queen walk through. There's our precious daughter. If they did not know what love meant, who would? No. And a big bad puppy. <laughs> Drag Queen Story Hour is really just people reading books to kids. There's hmm. nothing, there's no underlying mission. It is nothing more than having someone come in, read books to children, and make them feel welcome and included. Remember learning how to walk? <laughs> I remember learning how to walk, but it was with these shoes on. <laughs> Friends the news. It turns out I'm not a narwhal. Of course you are. Uh, and I never had specifically, like for myself, uh, like a role model or someone to look up to at an early age to say it was okay to be gay, um, to be a drag queen, to be, you know, whatever I wanted to be. Um, so that's, that's why I think it's important to, to be here today um, to show the kids that, you know, there is someone that you can look up to and you can be who you want to be. I, I think it's just important that he sees this as something that's normal, it's accepted, it's not anything to be ashamed of. Um, and if I just keep taking him to events like this, it's just going to be a part of life. 
Alright, you can start that one. You can start that one. We have some people who are naive to the plan of the enemy. Why? Because they're not seeing this as an issue. They're taking their children to be indoctrinated, to be seeing this type of um, lifestyle. And to them, there's nothing wrong with it. So Dry Queen Hour is all over America. And I, I just saw Minister Jim saying it's in Canada as well. How long will it take as when America catches the coal? We get the impact. How long will it take before we start hearing that these persons um, read into our children, preying upon our children? Because they think that it's, children may think this is play. These people are dressing up. It's all about play because their minds have not been fully developed to understand what truly is happening. And parents who one would think have more developed minds are carrying these children to these events. Because if you looked at the video, you saw children there who, who babies, toddlers up to maybe children who are like eight or nine. So the responsibility is also on the parent to parent your child with the principles of the word. All right, you can go on to the next slide. I want to touch on this slide. No, no, I'm, I'm, I just put it here, but I'll encourage you to go and look at this Barbados Shell Protection Bill. Now, I, by no means, I'm a lawyer, but over the last few weeks, we've heard persons uh, having the opportunity to go to Parliament, speak on this bill, aspects of this bill, and I decided to sit down and read the bill to see what, as we say in Barbados, what all the fuss was about. So click to the next slide, because the church has to be knowledgeable. In this day and age, we have to be knowledgeable. In this particular bill or this act, Child Protection Act 2023, page 20, the caption is participation of a child. And I want you to watch this. A child shall be entitled to participate in a decision that is likely to have a significant impact on his life. And when we talk about child the, in the in the um, annex, it says child means a person who is under the age of 18. So even though I'm not a lawyer, I, I always find the wording of acts and bills and these legislations to be fascinating as they capture the essence of the author, but the reader has to interpret what they think the author needs. So, so they're saying a child should have the opportunity to participate in decisions that can impact their life. So a child at nine comes home and says, mommy, I'm a girl, but I feel like I'm supposed to be a boy. And they can make that decision. They have the authority to make certain decisions like that. A nine-year-old, do we think a nine-year-old should be making these decisions? At nine, some of the boys still run about the place getting sweaty. In Barbados at, at nine, a lot of the girls know still, you know? They're still girls and boys, but parents are allowing them to make decisions that can impact their life in the future. Go to the next slide. And I want you to pay attention to this. Under the same at page 17, the, the heading is principles to be applied in the administration of the act. The following principles shall be applied in the administration of this act. The safety and welfare of a child watch these words, shall be given paramount consideration in all actions and decisions in relation to the child. So parents, once upon a time, parents had rights. But, but if you're reading these things now, the welfare of the child they're trying to say is, is going to be more significant than even parents' rights. Because if children decide that they want to make a transition from a girl to a boy and the parents aren't allowing them to make this transition, the authorities, because you're not looking after my welfare, call the authorities. The safety and welfare of a child who has been removed from his parents shall be paramount to the rights of the parent. But well, watch this one I write. Where a child, remember we said the child is under 18, where a child is able to form his own views on a matter concerning his safety or welfare, he shall be afforded 
an opportunity to freely express his views. And as I said, this word freely express, ex this expression of self, every document you're reading now, you, you see the education reform document that recently came out last week has in about ex even the subject areas now they want to do certain things where children can express themselves. The grooming policy under the the headache, the first section in the grooming policy also has in some about children being able to express themselves. So they're going to be able to freely express their views. And his views are to be given due weight in accordance with his developmental capacity and the circumstances. So we're saying now that children under the age of 18, their decisions know that they can make, that, that can transform their lives and who they are and impart them down the road. I've been reading a lot of stories of persons who are detransitioning, persons who are getting these reversal surgeries. There's a lot of regret. There's a lot of suicidal thoughts. There's a lot of instability. They're very unstable mentally because they recognize the decision they made at nine and 10. Now they're 21. They want to be who they were. So it comes back to that thought that Reverend Jackman has been stating, the identity. Do our children know their true identity? The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image. But do our children know that? Because as they get older, they're shifting. Today won't be a boy, today won't be a girl. And we're, parents are saying, oh, that's no problem. And one of the things for me about this whole transitioning process it's a money-making affair by doctors. It takes years to fully do these hormonal treatments, to do all these different surgeries. And when I was doing my research, it takes four to eight years to do reversal surgeries, fully reversal surgeries, four to eight years. And a lot of times I did recognize that persons who started the reversal surgery ended their life with suicide. They couldn't, they, they were wrestling with, I was a boy, now I'm a girl, I want to go back to being a boy. They're wrestling with it to the extent that they take their own lives. So, so we have to be our children's keeper. You know, be our children's keeper. Watch out for what is happening. These different laws and legislations. I know persons have had the opportunity to go to parliament and speak about these. We as well need to have our say out there in the atmosphere. Any thoughts on this before I close off? Oh, let me close yes, off. Yes, yes. I, I, I want to come in again. This is where the rubber really hits the road. And we have to be careful that we are not drawn into positions and blindness. That's why the church has to be aware. People are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And this is the, is the reason behind what we are doing, to inform people that they're fully aware of what is happening, that we can act based on, on information and knowledge and truth, because that's how we have to instruct people. Now, I mentioned about how we are being identified in terms of our sexuality, but now society is even going further. It isn't, isn't even how you are born now, is what you feel. So if you have the organs of a female, you feel a male, that is what is given credence. And, and, and to think that you're giving that to children at three and four and five years old, and you watch that legislation, that's precisely what is happening in the States. And they have actually, and, the, and in Canada, they've actually passed legislation that will give them the right to take a child from a parent's home if the child does not affirm, sorry, if the parent does not affirm what mm -hmm. the child mm -hmm. feels about its mm -hmm. own identity. That's a Correct. serious thing. A, a father in Canada was, was fined for $30,000 <laughs> Correct. Because he because he would not affirm that his his little girl thing it was wanted to transition to, to a boy and, and he he would not accept that and that's how far legislation is going. So you watch that language there. They're not being specific, but those general terms there mm -hmm. falling right back into the same laws that you already passed in California and and a lot, a lot of states in the United States as well as in Canada and Britain now is reversing some of the things that they have set in place because they see the trouble and the problems that this thing is causing in their society. So we have to be very careful where that legislation is pointing 
because I believe it's being influenced by things mandated from outside because of, of, of the, uh, the alignment that we're making and, and, and the funds that we're getting and, and they're superimposing their agenda on us. And we have to be very careful of that and stand against that as well. Thank you. So the last slide there. So uh, I'm sorry. someone speaking? Somebody else's hand was up? Sorry about that. No, you go ahead and I, I will make my point after you finish. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the church does have a response. Uh, we are to expose sin. We are to let persons know, preach what is sin. Don't, don't, don't try to compromise. Don't try to not speak it. We preach it. We're to speak out against sin, boldly declare what is truth. We're to extend God's grace, mercy, and love to all. And it's important for us that we, as, as it was said, we need to go out because you're finding many times that they're not coming to us, but they are there. We know who they are. We know where they are hanging out, as they say in Barbados. So we need to have that knowledge, ask the Holy Spirit to direct us, do any training that we need to align ourselves with various organizations who have put things in place and can help you go out to minister to the to such persons, so that one, they're aware that God loves them. No compromise. We got to preach and teach the truth. Our young people know a lot of the Bible stories we grew up knowing, a lot of our ch young children don't know. The verses we grew up learning, Psalm 23 and Psalm 121 and John 3, 16, and a lot of our children today don't even go to church that they can hear John 3, 16. So we have a responsibility as a church. Our nations, young people are our responsibility. I've said, as churches, we are all in a community. We can adopt the school and once a month or twice a month going to the school and share the message with the school that is close to our church. There are too many churches across Barbados for that to be impossible to be done. Huh? Too many churches in Barbados for us that we can't adopt one of the 22 secondary schools or their 81 primary schools. You're telling me that one we we as a church can't go into these institutions because the children ain't coming to Sunday school. The people ain't coming to church and it ain't COVID. No, people ain't coming to church. So as was said by Minister James, we need to go to them. Know what is happening in our society. We have to be knowledgeable. All these laws and legislations. Earlier this year, the UN had a, a gay pride launch. Did we know that? The, the UNDP and all these places, uh, the Interdevelopment Bank and all these things are allowing service, doing surveys and all different types of things in our nation. Are we aware? And our children are the ones that are most of the time being targeted but we got to stand in front behind at the side of our children we got to protect our children from the society that they're in that is sending them all these mixed messages about who they are and their identity and let them know that they're born in the image and likeness of god then we got to keep the bible as our standard the bible is our rule of faith and christ alone is Lord. So as a church and we do these things, as a church and we go out and we share, we're able to impact the lives of not only the homosexual or the first transgender, but persons in sin period, so that while they can come to a knowledge and understanding of Jesus who can save and Jesus who can be their Lord. So I thank you for listening to me tonight um uh, are there you could go to the next slide are there any comments because i do believe as a church we need to be salt and light in the world and stand for truth speak truth and live the truth any thoughts any comments um opening the floor as i end yeah, yeah i would like to make a comment good night good night to you sir yes um, a lot of, of the callers over the 
the, the time that we've been having these discussions have alluded to the fact that the church has been very reticent when it comes to, to addressing the whole transgender and the LGBT issue. My, my, I'm, I'm wondering if, if the church has recognized over the years that it has lost so much popularity that it doesn't want to, fall, to, to find itself um, losing further ground in that area. I wonder if the church feels that if it speaks out too strongly, that it would, there would be a back, backlash, not just from the public itself, not just from the LGBT movement itself, but the public in general. And I and I, I want I'm wondering if the church is afraid of 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 losing what little ground that it now stands on because over the years the church has lost a lot of its popularity. Even when when parents go, oh, you, you just you just made reference to the um the the the, the what was it oh. the the act the legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that legislation. I, I'm pretty sure I, I remember some parents going out there and protesting, but I didn't see the church standing alongside them to, to protest, um, to, to, to make their position known as well. So, so it seems to me that we have four like this, and we, 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 we say a whole lot about these situations that are happening in the world nowadays. But to go there and stand publicly, it seems as though the church has fear. Right? And I think that the fear may be that they do not want to become marginalized in, the, in society. Because to a large extent, the church has become marginalized. A lot, if you check a number of the churches, you'll find that the, 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 the role has dropped significantly over the years. It's, hard, it's very hard to attract young young people, for for instance, and these are the people now who are part of are mainly caught up with checking these situations on social media and whatnot, and being au fait for all these situations. Um, the older people in 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 the church tend not to follow so closely, but if you check. The LGBT movement is it's a lot of young people who are pushing this this agenda, and I, 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 I'm I'm just hoping that what the church that what happens in this series of of of, of discussions is not just what happens in this series of discussions and goes no further than this, and that the church really can really show itself to be strong and stand up. And now I don't mean the thing the churches that stand up the thing on the pulpit, um, away from the public, but stand up in the public and make the, and make its, its views known on these issues because a lot of these issues are not dis discussed publicly as coming from the church. A lot of these issues are discussed publicly as coming from some parents, as coming from um, those who maybe anti uh, um, transgender that type that type of person is standing up more than the church itself what well, one of the things i've found though is that as Rania alluded to it, that before the church would stand and speak we used to hear hell we used to hear damnation we used to hear fire but over the years we have tried to have a sweet message went out into the atmosphere. And uh, we've been somewhat compromising what we preach because we, we don't want to offend, we don't want this, but we got to preach the truth. You noted about the church being out there, but there's there's an organization that every year has a march in November. They, they walk from town to um, Bay Street, family first. And every year they're Christians, and they share a message. They let persons know what the church stance is on these particular aspects. And they focus in a lot on marriage. They focus in a lot on uh, family and what's not. And so there are persons who are out there speaking out. It, mean, it needs, however, 
more than just one person speaking out. It needs us. All of us need to speak out for truth. All of us need to speak out for truth because there are times when we, we try to, as you say, shy away from a conversation because we may not want to offend somebody. But if, you, if the aim of offending leads that person to salvation, don't put yourself in, don't put yourself in bloody waters. Share the I message. Believe, I, believe the more, message I believe that the more this church stays away from these issues, the more marginalized it will become. Correct. So we got to be out there on the front line sharing the message. Sister King. Good evening, everyone. Um, Alicia, thanks for a great presentation. And as was said by Pastor Richards, biblically sound. What I hear and what is concerning, and as I trace my walk in the church, way back under the Griffiths, I remember in youth fellowship, we would always hear, and I guess sometimes it got on our on our nerves because what 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 was what was pushed in the way that they knew how was a call to purity, a call to purity. There were sessions, whether they were at the church or in their home. Um, there were sessions which dealt with practical things. And I agree that what has been done, you know, it's being said we are staying away from the LGBTQ um, conversation up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, we, ha we have not said a lot about it in church, but it's not only that. We have stayed away as well from things about purity. And I remember recently speaking with someone who says, maybe maybe when young people hear a virgin, do, do some of them um, understand what is being said? And then those who understand, it does not, it does not matter. So I think we have to revisit, we're talking about when the conversations are finished, are they going to just rest in our heads and become lost? Or are we as a church going to move to that point where now in our teachings, in our the, the impressionable minds that we have in Sunday school, um, are we going to are we going to move to teaching the truth about the things that are really presenting? issues in our society, in the schools, in the home. Again, yes, the church, but in our homes, do mothers and fathers uh, make the call as well, make the call as well to our children about purity. I remember in the home, my mother was not a Christian back then. And my mother would have said, you know, I live, this is what she said to her daughters, I live my life, I don't want y'all to live the life that I live. Yeah. And she, there will be a call from her for purity as well, remaining pure. But how many, how many of us, maybe as Christian parents, we are not, we are not making those calls anymore. And, and it's, it's really serious and we need, we need to get back to the blessed old Bible. We need to get back to the old past because in the old past, there is power. Amen. Uh, I see Keisha placed a, a question there. How is the church going to deal with the issue of cross-dressing? Um, earlier this year, we, we read a book at church, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, and there's a a gentleman was a pastor at Brooklyn Tabernacle. And one day he recognized this gentleman was coming to his church, who was dressing, gentleman dressing as a female. It surprised him, but the person kept coming and coming. When they accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, he transformed the person to the extent that the person took off their female garb 
and started to come as a meal. The encounter with Jesus, the encounter with the Holy Spirit is what shifted that man from coming to church, dressing, female, and now he was coming as a male. And his life after at Seminary Christ was lived, sharing the message with other cross-dressed persons who came into the church and God transformed them. So in the church that God deal with this, you know, as a church, we have to speak the message. Paul planted the Paulist word, God gives the increase. God at the end of the day is who will touch the lives of persons. And God at the end of the day who will cause these persons to be transformed. We can't transform nobody. We can speak. as we, People say you can care, uh, call to water, but you can't make a drink. We can speak. We can preach. We can encourage. But when you see the Holy Spirit hit and that encounter happens, the lives of persons change. And so we need to pray that persons have an encounter with Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit is able to transform their lives and they be who God says that they're supposed to be. When it comes to this thing about exemptions from the law, we are exempt when a law is put in place for one, it's put in place for all. So all of us will have to deal with whatever laws that are put in place in our nation. All right. Any other comments before I close off at this time? Um, yeah, I want yes, Pastor sure. Alicia. Yeah. Um, with the, that same issue of cross-dressing, I'm not just making a reference to the gay community because we have Christian women in the churches now that are cross-dressing. They are wearing pants. So it is a broad issue that I'm talking about, not just the gay community, man dressing as woman. We have it happening in the church right now. So a woman who wears a pants is cross-dressing? Yes. 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 So, so so because you're not a man pants was made for a, for a male trousers were made for male if, and if that you is how you are, would, and that is you how you would differentiate in, between a male and a female but if you look back in history right the women who had on these corsets and all these different things they wore pants we used to, uh, uh, for the for the Bajans, who would understand what puff leg panty? They wore pants. They wore a uh, 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 on the garb. Women back then who did more cycles, they had a pants. Women who were on horses, you would find that they would wear a pants underneath because they would sling their feet to a side. So a pants isn't necessarily a sling that someone is cross dressing and, and that they are off because so many persons across the world wear a pants. Key thing we need to remember. Um, Keisha is the heart is the heart and God is when God works on your heart he 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 puts things in you that helps you transform so today you may come in um dressing with a wig and go on this um shirt and, and you look totally like a woman but after the encounter with God God said look I don't want to see you in that here I don't want you in this when you're walking in that same people with that the same body anybody? We can't change persons. This is the key thing. The Holy Spirit in us is what convicts us and tells us, nah, but did I wrong? So we have to get to a place where we allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. I, I am not going to agree with you that women who wear pants are cross-dressing because that in itself is not a heart matter. A pants, a shirt, a t-shirt, a button shirt, those are heart matters. The, uh, and those um don't as I said don't don't major on the minors. The the major thing here is sin. The major thing here is the heart. That those be the major things, not not a, a wearing of a pants. All right. All right, people, we've gone past our time. And I oh, see one more hand. All right, Minister James, I'll let you have the last word and then I'll pray and then. All right, thank you, thank thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, I I just want to touch on uh, two things. Uh, let, let me let me first say that for those that are saying that the church and um about 
not going in the community. Uh, the apostles got locked up and beaten and all that kind of stuff. So therefore, you know what? And they did it for the gospel and they said Correct. they were glad. They were happy. Mm -hmm. They were happy that it happened to you because Jesus said, this is going to happen to you. And those guys were happy that they were put in prison and beaten. That aside, um, mm -hmm. Pastor also touched, Pastor touched on uh, a situation in Canada I, and me living in Canada and uh, being a witness of uh, one of those persons that always out there witnessing to, to the to the same homosexuals and stuff like that. That's a part of my ministry. Um, there, there was there was a gentleman here in, in Niagara who got locked up because he said that his child did not come to school to learn about homosexual, um, the, the LGBT. They put the child out of the school and the, and, and the man got charged because they said that he was quote unquote threatening teachers, teachers, because he's, he stood up and said, look, my child did not come to school to learn about um, gays. It came to learn about math and English and geography and that kind of stuff. He did not want his child to be a part of this whole LGBT, but it is enforced in a lot of schools here in Canada now. Is enforced. It is a. It is actually a. Is actually a, a subject. So the children can decide. A child can decide if he wants to be a, a, a man or a woman. They're teaching that. Lord help us. It's, it's, a, it's a fact. And then the, the, the last thing I want to say is that there, there are there are there, my, there's a pastor here in Canada. He's uh, I think he's being let go today, in between today and tomorrow. Who is also who is also get he also gets out there and preach the gospel of Jesus and the gays in Toronto. All of them always gang up against him and think and and the police locked up the the preacher. He was not preaching against homosexuality. He was preaching. The homosexuals came out of their gap in his face. And the police came and locked up the pastor, and he's coming out of prison today for preaching the gospel. That means so, we gotta be ready for. We have we, to be ready. We, no, no, Wherefore, I said to the Lord, he told them that want to suffer many things for my name. For so my name's sake, we gotta be ready to to go forward and know that Stop this being gospel. Afraid. Stop yeah, being afraid yeah. to lose to lose people. We, this is mm. our job. Our job is the Bible says to go two by two and preach the gospel. And I I, I am a firm believer that church nowadays is lagging because they don't want to lose membership. And this is our, Jesus got out there and they killed Jesus for telling the truth. They killed the Messiah for telling the truth. But we are in in. I'm sorry. I know I may sound real bad, but. I, I think the church is lagging too much. We are losing. We are losing out because we are want we want to keep members. And the LGBT don't give a damn about the church. I can tell you that they do not care about the church. If the church go out and tell them and teach them but that they're doing wrong, I I must I will um I will confess though that I have two of them, two homosexuals, two guys that are that are now considering becoming Christians. Amen. So they, they want to hear the gospel. It's not that they don't want to hear. They hate us, but they want to know that we are telling the truth and living what we're saying that we're living. So we've got to get out there. Thank you very much. A, a, a great program, man. Great, 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 great stuff, guys. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, God can truly transform anyone. So let's let's have a word of prayer our father and our god we are thankful for your grace and your mercy father we are thankful for your love we are thankful that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light and father today as we shared your word we pray lord that persons would be placed on our hearts that we too can share this message of grace and this message of love this message of salvation with that they too can come to a knowledge and understanding of you, not only as Savior, but as Lord of their lives. We are thankful, Lord, that you transformed us and you can transform anybody. You brought us from, but your word says, but God commanded his love towards us and that when we were sinners, you sent your son to die 
for us. And today, Lord, may we maintain your standard of holiness, righteousness, and purity. May we speak thus, saith the Lord, as we are directed by the Holy Spirit. May we have our eyes open and may we be watchful to the plan of the enemy, whether it be through the legislations or whether it's through the things being said on the media or in the newspaper. Father God, may we understand that the enemy is very deceptive and sly and his strategies, strategies today and tactics are not being hidden, but they're out in our face. And we, the people of God, have to be knowledgeable in what is happening in our nation today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. And we pray, Lord, your blessings upon everyone, those who may be struggling. Help them to know that there's a God who's able to free them, who the sun sets free is free indeed. And they don't have to be back in, in bondage with the yokes of bondage, but that, that they can be free truly. So, Father, Lord, help them to find someone they can share with, someone who can minister to them and show them the love of Jesus Christ, that their lives indeed can be changed and transformed. We thank you for this platform. We thank you for the persons who have come to this platform. We pray the knowledge given that they will receive and be able to share it with others. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. I just want to share two announcements amen. with you as we... Go this evening. Fabian, you can put up the last slide there. On this session that we are in culminates on Sunday. And we have, you have it, Fabian? On Sunday with Pastor Carrington. I'm going to invite all of you to join us on Sunday, um, the 22nd at 6 at Chapman Street. Pastor Carrington is going to look at answering the tough questions. So if you have questions, you bring them. That's the final part in this series looking at the truth about homosexuality and transgenderism. And then from me, an invitation is extended to all young men ages 13 to 30 to be a part of the Priest Within program. It will be held on Saturday, the 18th of November at 9 a.m. at the Jackson Church of God. And one thing, it is free. It is free. It is free. Interested persons can get the registration link from any Church of God's pastor, and the speakers on this occasion to the young men will be Pastor Ronnie Quimby, Reverend Steve Moore, and Minister Nigel Jules. So as you go, may God bless, keep, and guide you. And I'm thankful that you were able to join us in the online session. And I pray that you're able to join us on Sunday. So have a blessed and enjoyable night, everyone.